the Civil Society. She is the MP for Wigan, worked for uh, the charity sector before she was an MP and is now, of course, um, the, shadow, uh, uh, the Shadow Secretary of State for levelling up housing and communities. So we'll listen to uh, a short speech by her and then maybe take some questions. Lisa Nan, thank you so much. Introduction. Just read out, read out a list of all the jobs I've been sacked or demoted from over the last 13 years. Let's hope this time I manage to level myself up and get into government in order to change what is a completely unsustainable situation across the north of England. No more excuses. We can't go on like this. After 13 years of virtually no growth across this country, we can't fund our public services. Chief amongst them, as many of you in local government in this room will know, is social care and the crisis in the National Health Service, our crown jewel public service, run down to the point where millions of people can't get treatment and patients lie on the floor in A&E departments across the country. Our high streets are to communities, what the A&E is to health and social care. It's the warning light that flashes on the dashboard that tells you that the system, the wider system, is fundamentally broken. Behind every boarded up high street is a local economy that is failing. Failing to grow, failing to put money in people's pockets, failing to give young people choices and chances so that they don't have to get out in order to get on. And that is our failure as politicians, not theirs. After a decade of decay and decline, so much is broken in Britain, but chief amongst them, our political system. Today the North comes together to discuss our collective future, but we're doing so much more than that in this room right here today. Because this country's inability to grapple with every major challenge that we now face, struggling public services, cost of living crisis, failing town centres, an ageing population, an energy revolution that will leave no family untouched. All of that comes back to one thing, that we've written off the talent, the potential and the assets of most people in most parts of Britain, and this has been going on for too long. This isn't just a tragedy, it's a social crime. Britain is almost unique in trying to power a modern economy using only a handful of people in a handful of sectors in a few small parts of the country. And my friend Carsten Schneider, who addressed this conference earlier, told me in Germany last year that while they're taking two countries and are on a journey to turn them into one, what he's seen in Britain is taking one country and taking it on a journey to turn it into two. Now that has left us with a crisis, but it's not just a crisis in the north. It's left us as a, with, a, with a crisis in London and in our major cities of housing, of air pollution and extraordinary levels of poverty and strain on public services. And it's left us with a one word plan for the rest of Britain, redistribution. To find our way out of this national malaise, we needed to be bold. Instead, we got a lecture on the merits of the Roman Empire. We got a Hunger Games style system where ministers choose who gets a leisure centre, some picnic areas and traffic light improvements from behind a desk in Whitehall. I was born in the North. I was raised in the North. I was educated in the North. I'm bringing my family up in the North. And I have no truck with some of the headlines that we saw this morning. It's grim up North, really. But what's grim is business and political leaders who are forced to go cap in hand to Whitehall to ask permission for what we know works and our communities that are completely cut out of that conversation. So together we're calling time today on this short-term, arrogant, sticking plaster approach that leaves us lurching from crisis to crisis. We can't go on like this. In Bradford, in Sunderland, in Aberdeenshire, through arts and culture, through wind and hydrogen, the ambitious, proud people and the political leaders that back them, you can glimpse what the future could look like. 
The councils who are pioneering community wealth building, the mayors taking back control of our buses, and yes, Steve, our trains. The, the mayors who are going off and pioneering new ways of having influence. There's a reason why the fabulous Tracy Brogan could go over to India and bring back a thousand jobs to West Yorkshire. She knows her community, she fights for her community, and she understands not just the problems that Whitehall obsesses with, but the potential that exists across the whole of West Yorkshire and not just in Leeds. The communities that are reclaiming our housing stock street by street, the business leaders who are investing in our natural assets even when the government won't. Ambition is everywhere in the towns, villages and cities that were once the engines of Britain but for too long have been written off and written out of our national story. And for 15 years since the global financial crash, the failure, the catastrophe of running an economy like this has been plain to see. But every time the public has sounded the alarm, hitting our politicians with tsunami after tsunami of discontent, our creaking political system has done nothing. We can debate the merits of different devolution models and funding formulas, but this... This is the collective task facing our generation of political leaders. To respond to that siren call or face obsolescence, to change or die. We must succeed where successive generations have failed in various ways to varying degrees for a century and we must do so for one simple reason. Because ending a century of centralisation and unleashing the power of all people in all parts of Britain is no longer a nice to have or a local or regional issue. It is at the heart of whether this country has a future or not. It is the only way to heal a fractured and divided nation. It is the only way to build an economy that works for most of us again so we can fund our public services and sustain thriving places. In short, it is the only way to build a country that works. Now, why would you trust us to do our part when you've had commitments to change from every aspiring government in recent decades? It's spawned too many versions of enterprise zones to count and an endless round of Northern Powerhouse press releases with every single promise broken. Why would you trust an agenda that lives or dies at the whim of whoever happens to be Prime Minister that term or in recent times that week. Well, I'll tell you why. Because we're going to bake this in to our programme for government across the whole of government, not just one minister or one department. A covenant between you and us and the British people and today I want to tell you how. Firstly, we believe that to have strong, thriving, resilient communities particularly in our coastal and industrial towns that have so much to offer. This country doesn't need one national growth plan, but hundreds of local and regional growth plans driven by you and the people that you serve. Based on the brilliantly diverse assets and skills and geography across our country. For too long, all we've talked about in relation to the north of England is redistribution. From here on in, we will replace that word with contribution to empower our communities to take control of their own economic future and to take charge of their own destiny. So today we're firing the starting gun on the biggest transfer of power out of Whitehall and Westminster in British history with one simple ask. Tell us what you need to create strong local economies and thriving inclusive communities and we will back you. There are a million good jobs on the road to net zero and a global race to get them. Why shouldn't young people in Barnsley and Bolton have the chance to power us through the next century like their parents and grandparents powered us through the last? That's why we've committed to the biggest investment in green energy transition in our history, to underwrite the economic growth plans created by the people who live in those communities and see assets and potential where Whitehall sees only problems. To bring back good, well-paid jobs to places that were once the engine room of Britain. And if you write the plan, we'll support the jobs of the future and hand you the tools to deliver in all places, not just some. Secondly, in our first King's speech, 
will bring forward plans to flip the presumption of power from Whitehall to the Town Hall through the Take Back Control Act. Oppositions tend to like the idea of handing over power, governments a little bit less so. So if you ask for powers, we will place ourselves under a legal obligation to hand them over or explain why not. And if there are reasons why not, we will be obliged to set out a path for communities to realise that ambition for every part of Britain and the people in them. No more top-down determinism of which communities qualify for powers and which don't. No more central government dictating local governance models as a bargaining chip. In the Act will be a promise written into law that leaders can request anything that has already been devolved to another area of similar scale within England. So that every part of Britain that wants to will take charge of its own destiny on housing, transport, energy, childcare, skills, employment support and training, with the right to run their own bus services and invest in the rail, tram and bus networks they need. And to drive major infrastructure problems, not from Western projects, not from Westminster, but from South Yorkshire, from Merseyside, from Teesside, working together across the north. Because if Northern Powerhouse Rail have been put into the hands of the north without constant interference from government, you can bet that our northern leaders would have delivered it by now and delivered it in full. <laughs> but we won't stop there. We know that the power to deliver services means nothing without the ability to plan for the long term with the funding and resources to deliver them. Now I want to level with you here. Rachel Reeves has been clear that the next Labour government will have ironclad fiscal rules because it's people's money and as many of you know in this room they don't have a lot of it. So every penny that we spend as the next Labour government will be spent wisely but that means it will be spent by the right people in pursuit of the right aims. Which is why national government spending will line up behind those local growth plans, not ad hoc pots of funding, short term pots of funding without the ability to plan, but national government rolling in so that when leaders, our great northern leaders, like many of them in this room today, whether it's Jamie or Andy or Steve or Ollie or Tracy, and our council leaders as well, the brilliant Bev Craig, showing exactly what can be done from right here in Manchester. When those leaders write their local growth plans, we will line up government funds behind them. Because is there anything more absurd, unstrategic or anti-growth than having to bid in to two different departments for buses and for bus charging points? Now, I'm, I'm hopeful that there is a political consensus that longer term funding settlements with far more flex in the budgets are the future. The current system is deeply frustrating for all of you. In government it will be frustrating for us and it is totally undemocratic, leaving you accountable to Westminster, not the people you serve, for how money is spent. So time is up. We're going to do things differently. We'll usher in a new generation of civic leadership by empowering and supporting local government offices everywhere to rebuild their capacity the consistent first-rate management of public money, the planners and the architects that you need to build beautiful places, expertise in procurement, trade and finance. We know how badly this has been hollowed out and will provide the support to rebuild this capacity across local and regional government, drawing on those places first and foremost, where it still exists and from whom so much can be learned. And with this capacity in place, we'll provide the route for local authorities and mayors to take on properly integrated, long-term funding settlements with greater financial certainty and the ability to plan for the future. No more smoke and mirrors announcements from central government. Genuine power and decision-making and resources for communities to deliver for themselves. Now, this is a brilliantly diverse country, it's a bright, brilliantly diverse region, and we're comfortable with different communities doing things differently. But some of us are not more equal than others, and never again will we allow our political system to behave as though we are. Which is why the Take Back Control Act will also put into place the recommendation 
by the future of the UK Commission that there should be a constitutional requirement to rebalance the UK's economy and equalise living standards across the country over time. But the route to achieving this doesn't lie through raising more taxes on working people who simply cannot afford it, whichever region they happen to live in. It lies in empowering every part of the country with the capacity and the tools and the investment to deliver sustained growth for themselves. For too long, this relationship between national and local government has been deeply disrespectful, based on dependence, the begging bowl culture, that the Mayor of the West Midlands rightly excoriated last week. We seek a new relationship of equals based on mutual respect, a covenant between national, regional and local partners and most of all, the people that we serve. So by the end of our first term, we want to see a significant expansion of economic devolution in England with local leaders using a range of powers to drive growth and prosperity in communities across the country. Now, I'm going to be honest, that will ask more of many of you in this room than has ever been asked before. Because the frontline workforce who deliver the services that sustain jobs and growth, and the investors who stand ready to play their part in rebuilding Britain's public services, the social housing, the town centres, the physical infrastructure, they can only build a country that works if they have national and local leaders who have a vision and the ambition, skill and staying power to see it through. Who are prepared to embrace a different sort of leadership from the broken models that have cost us the trust of the British people, felt most acutely at national level, but, but without any question, in many local communities too. One that is far more open, accountable, transparent, willing to partner with whoever it takes, business and workforce, across political boundaries and govern not to the people, but with the people that we serve. Now, I know that's a lot to ask. 13 stormy years have battered our communities and local government has been asked to step up over and over again, leading this country through the pandemic when central government floundered. The last line of defence for children broken by hunger and homes without heat in the winter. Our councils have been hollowed out, burnt out, trying to spin gold out of thread for a decade takes its toll. And it's tempting to look back on previous decades when the taps were on and funding flowed from national to local and to seek only this, a better resourced, dependent relationship in which a small group of people would continue to hold all the power. I say to replicate such a system would squander the visionary leadership that we've heard today in this room. We can do so much better than this. We have to do better than this. Our broken political system is no longer negotiable, it must change or die. And it is precisely in these times when so much is broken, where nothing is certain, where so much is at stake that real change becomes not just possible, but inevitable. And this is what's at stake. We're standing here today in the city that I was born in 40 years ago. We're just a few miles from here in the mines and the mills and the factories. We built this country's wealth and influence. And we gave the world the free trade hall, the first free library. We're a city shaped by waves of immigration that have changed and developed and powered this country over centuries. And that's how I know, drawing on the history that we have and the ambition that we have, that we here in the North can build the country that we've believed in all of our lives, but not yet seen. A confident country, big, diverse and generous enough to contain all its people and celebrate the contribution that we have to make in every part of Britain. Because across every part of Britain, in every part of the community, despite all the decay and the drift of the last decade, Hope burns brighter than ever before, and there are brilliant people, ordinary people, doing extraordinary things. So no more excuses. It's time to come together. It's time to build. Thank you.
very interesting taste of the direction of travel. Um, much more ambitious, really, and, and, and urgent than we heard from the Secretary of State, although the, uh, the sort of agreement, really, about uh, devolving more power and more finance. Um, we're going to take a, a couple of questions from the floor. We're also going to take one from Joseph Tymon from Manchester Evening, uh, Manchester Evening News. So if you want to go to mics, I'll take a few questions. I just, uh, I just want to ask, the Take Back Control Act, would it work on the basic structure that we have at the moment of the, the city regions, the combined mayoral authorities? Is that, is, it, is that the way it is going to be based? Or are you going to reorganise, rejig the uh, reconfigure, if you like, the jurisdiction? Uh, look, uh, the current approach that we have that imposes governance models on parts of the country, I believe, is deeply undemocratic. Um, there are many parts of the country where people can see the value in having combined authorities. You know, I, I live here in Greater Manchester. We've got a fantastic mayor in Andy Burnham, and it's done a lot for our region that we've got someone... Um, with that strong a voice and that commitment to place and that rooted in partnership working across Greater Manchester to deliver for us. But it works because there's some economic geography. On a scale, can say, I, I, I'll do it as well. Yeah, but there's a, there's, a, there's a key reason why we believe that you have to put skills and the resources that go behind skills investment into local and regional hands. It's because you cannot drive local growth without being able to skill up young people to get those jobs. You go to somewhere like Barrow and you talk to young people who can see these incredible world-leading jobs from their primary school playground, but they'll say to you, I might as well try and go to the moon as to get those jobs. Well, that's got to change. Okay, so skills, absolutely done deal. Andy made another, another pitch this morning, which I think was an interesting one, which is really a kind of Barnet formula for... for big city regions, or for, for at least part of the country. Which, now, it's an interesting one, because it's really, as applied to Scotland and Wales, it's a, it's a population-weighted kind of, if you spend it nationally, <coughs> you know, if you spend it on England, they automatically get the population equivalent. Um, just, I, I'm just interested in whether you think a kind of a single-check model, it's like, look, you just spend it, you can have the whole lot, we're spending this much in your patch on everything, police and health, and here's the money, you sort it. Is, is that a... Because in a way, that is a logical extension. That's what we do with... Westminster does with Scotland. Is, do we take it that far? And why wouldn't you take it that far? Um, so I think there is a growing political consensus now that single budget settlements with far more flex in the budget, not just for mayors and combined authorities, but for local authorities and groups of local authorities working together, is the future. But I think we need to be more ambitious than just thinking about expanding this model where national government hands over resources and local and regional government is able to spend it. it one of the great problems that we've had in this country is that because mayors and councils have to go begging, as Andy Street said, cap in hand to Westminster and Whitehall, they become accountable upwards but not downwards to the people that they serve. Now, there's a reason why, you know, Taking control of our buses in Greater Manchester took some time, and it's not just because um, Andy has had to fight an ongoing battle with the bus providers in order to take back democratic control. It's also because we've had to raise some of that money locally, and it's meant that he's been out in every part of Greater Manchester making the case to people for why that should be done and gaining their consent. So that model of raising money locally and accounting locally for how you spend it that is where I think we ought to be aiming for. You can't do it overnight. You would collapse local economies that are already falling further and further behind. But ultimately, we should be ambitious enough to think that the goal for this incredible region, the north of England, that has powered this country in living memory and can do it again, is to be able to raise our own money, stand on our own two feet and account to the people we serve for how we do that. Okay. Let's take... Um, is Joseph from... Manchester Union is here. Joseph, your question. We're getting one from the press here. Yeah, go ahead. No? Yeah, go, okay. I think it is working now. Is it working? That's yeah. it. Got it. There we go. Thanks. Hi, Lisa. Um, so we heard this morning um, about learning lessons about levelling up from East Germany. Um, growth in East Germany is driven by cities, not towns and villages, as far as I understand. 
Um, would growth be driven by cities under Labour? What role would towns and villages play under a Labour government? You know, one of the great challenges that we've got in, here in Britain is that we've got these great inequalities between regions, but we've also now got inequalities within regions that are even bigger. And if we really want to be serious about the north of England as the powerhouse of Britain, then we've got to take seriously closing that gap. It was Tracy who said to me a while ago, you know, investors come, they want to invest in Leeds, it's the golden goose. But, you know, Bradford has so much potential, so much to offer. That's why she went off and fought for Bradford to become the city of culture as part of this vision of a northern corridor of arts and culture that kickstarts regeneration and grows local economies and gets money back into people's pockets and fulfills the potential of most people across the region. I believe that we need a model like that across the whole of Britain. Because if you look at those industries of the future, we've got amazing universities in our major cities that are powering us ahead on things like life sciences and partnering with, with companies outside of the major cities in places like Burnley, who are still powerhouses in manufacturing. But look at the potential for clean energy. It's in our coastal and industrial towns that within living memory powered the world and could do again. That's why we say you don't just need one national growth plan or even just one model of city-led growth. You need to be thinking about the potential and the assets that exist in all places across all parts of the north. But it is interesting, isn't it, because the London model in the south of England is much more a commuter model of people from scattered towns around going in there and working and then going back home in the evening. Um, do you find, do you think that model has anything to teach the north that essentially towns? I mean, your constituency, Wigan, becomes more of a place for people to live and commutes into central Manchester for work as a kind of an, an economic hub where you get those so-called agglomeration benefits, as economists would describe it. That model hasn't delivered for anybody over the last few decades. It's forced more Not in more. the south of England. No, I mean, it, I mean, you know, look, a million people make their home in London every year trying to find better work. I know because 20 years ago I was one of them and I did find those things but what I also found were the cripplingly high housing costs that are blighting an entire generation I found struggling public services I found these huge extremes of inequality of poverty and wealth existing side by side it's just not sustainable for any part of the country if you undercook some parts of our economy you overheat others so that now disposable incomes in London when you account for housing costs are lower than nearly every region in the country even the winners are losing and I think we can do far far better okay. right I want to uh, let's take one from the we've got to take one from the floor we'll take you're waving your hand so enthusiastically can we run the mic down here keep your hand up so the uh, mic person knows one from the floor, and then we better go to tea. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. Go. Tell us who you are. We'd like to know. Hello, Lisa. Uh, Elizabeth Cameron, um, also chair of the GM Race Equality Panel. Um, I'd like to be able to speak to you about working people. So everything that everybody's talked about today is really wonderful, but I guess where I meet it at is, as a trade unionist, I, I hear from working class people, they simply cannot live at this moment. You know, we've We've all seen what's happening with the strikes. So I, I'd like to hear what you would say about that because then I align that with the lives of ethnically diverse people who, of course, then come underneath that level even further. Um, you know, we're black and Asian women four times more likely to die in childbirth. You know, some, some figures that, frankly, you know, we just don't want to live with. Young black men more likely to go to jail than to university. Um, so there's a massive bridge to, you know, a gap, if you like, that needs a bridge before we come to this place where we say, let's give it to the community they can do it. They're, they're lacking confidence, they're lacking skill, and they'll fail. We saw it happen before with Mossad, so I'll stop talking. But yeah, I think you no, get right. the question. Uh, it's, Thank a, you. it's a really good question. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, I mean, if there's one thing that I've learned in 13 years as a Member of Parliament and five years as a local councillor before that, 
It's that if you hand power to people who have a stake in the outcome and skin in the game, they work harder, they try more, they do for longer, they're more creative than anybody else because they can do no other. I learned that first and, first and foremost from mums, and it was largely mums who've been through my constituency surgery over the last decade, who have children with special educational needs. They have taken on opaque systems over and over again, and they always win, regardless of background, educational qualifications, levels of confidence, because it matters so much. And I genuinely believe that if you hand power over things like skills and procurement and trade to um, our local and regional leaders, people who, without exception, I'm looking at this front row of our fantastic leaders, all of them live in, raise their family in, um, and belong to the communities that they serve, they know that if you raise the wages of people who are really struggling, if you protect the wages and working conditions of people, whether it's our National Health Service or the BT Open Reach workers, whoever it is, you're getting money back into people's pockets. They're going out and spending it on local high streets. You're regenerating your local economies and you're staving off all of those massive problems that we've seen from this broken national model of storing up mental health crises and fractured families and communities that are struggling to get by. That's why moving power matters in the end. It's not because we care more about who holds power, about the structures, the institutions, the processes. It's because of the outcomes. It's because of what that delivers for people. Thank you for that. I, we should just end this session on saying that the, the logic of devolution, and you're really going for it with the Take Back Control Act, is that you do let local governments fail sometimes, right? Because it is unlikely they're all going to be spectacularly good all of the time. So you have to have the situation where you say, <coughs> you've screwed up. It is not the Whitehall Minister's job to, 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 to take responsibility or accountability. Voters in that area, you just boot out those idiots and get someone else in. Because they will fail sometimes, won't they? Yeah, of course they will, but I just challenge you, Evan, to walk into any A&E department, try and get on a train, try and get on a bus. No, I don't know if you've tried to get a bus, things, like, I, I, try getting a bus <laughs> across the north of England, and I can tell you that failure is not confined to local government. No, no, no. We've had not, years of national no, government. No, no, no. no, 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 no it's, just, it's just important to recognise that the logic of devolution is that other people may fail sometimes as opposed to central government. Can, can I say no one, one very quick thing about that before you kick me off stage? <laughs> it's that, I, I, you know, of course there'll be, there'll be failure. I can't imagine for a moment there would be failure on the scale that we're dealing with in Britain right now. But what I would say to you too is that the bigger challenge, I think, having spoken to successive uh, secretaries of state who've tried to do this in various ways under the last Labour government, under the previous Conservative government, and under the Cameron administration, is that the bigger challenge, actually, is that we've got to get comfortable with different parts of the country doing things differently. That, that is the logical consequence. Yeah. yeah. And people, if, if everyone's going to say, oh, it's a postcode lottery, I don't get the same bus cap in, in, in this area, to, bus fare cap in this area to that area. That, well, we've, we've got one now. Yeah, but we have, in fact, got one. Yeah, oh, okay. if, if you move power outwards to different yeah. places, do things differently, you don't like it, you can get rid of your local leaders. How do you do it right now? <coughs> Largely, you can't. We can do better than that. Right, we need to go to tea, but I think we should thank Lisa and Andy for <laughs> <laughs> Right. Thank you.